Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, brought to you by the commercial legal practice Aspect Legal. Now, joining us today is Simon Bedard, the founder and CEO of Exit Advisory Group. Now, in this episode, Simon and I cover some really interesting topics about the remuneration model in business broking and some of the challenges facing the industry and perhaps the opportunities that this brings into the future. Now, this raises some really good issues that we should all be thinking about in terms of value creation and how we all align ourselves to really getting that right outcome for all of the parties involved in a business sale transaction. This episode is certainly useful listening for brokers, M&A advisors, accountants, and anyone who is looking to appoint someone to help them in the sale of their business. So keep listening. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area. And hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, Simon. It's fabulous to have you here today talking about this very interesting and perhaps what might be slightly controversial topic. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah, great to be here. And uh, yeah, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to have a chat. Fabulous. So today we're talking about what's broken in the broking industry. Now, that's a uh, that's a bit of a leading question, isn't it? So I guess it presumes <laughs> that something is broken. And maybe before we get into that, maybe let's just talk very briefly about your background and why you're talking about this space, you, you know, right now. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So look, I guess I started our business about three years ago, um, mostly because I, I just saw a real need in the market uh, around this sort of broking space. You know, going back a bit further, I've, I've certainly had a lot of experience around finance investment, and, and I guess I've always really had this sort of value driver within me. You know, understanding what drives value for people in a business, and you know, really anything in life. Um, you know, most people put a dollar into something; they want to get two dollars out at some stage. So I have always been fascinated with what drives value and started a business in the past and I bought into another company and I'd sold out of that and I've been through all that sort of experience and you know look long story short I was looking for a business to buy uh, back around 2013 and and I found my experience engaging the business broking sector was was a real mixed bag I, it sort of gave me a lot of questions about you know how the sector worked and and who was in the space and well, I certainly came across some good brokers, but you know, I guess there was a lot to be desired about the interactions I had. And you know, speaking to a lot of other people, that that seems to be a very common thread. So, so we basically kicked off our business with this view of, you know, hey, you know, we can change the world here and make a big difference and add a lot of value. And uh, and look, it's been a really interesting ride, and there's been a lot of lessons learned. So, I think where we're at at this stage of the game is is really saying, hey, you know, we understand that there are issues out there. And I think it's probably really easy and quick to sort of fire off and say, oh, brokers are terrible or this happens and that happens. But, you know, really, I think it's I think it runs a bit deeper than that. And I think if we all take a sort of step back a little bit, you, you start to see some of the, the moving parts and, and some of the sort of cause and effect that could be leading to, to poorer outcomes for business owners. Yeah. And look, I'm I'm really interested in the future. What what does this broking or business sale and acquisition space look at in the future? And, and in fact, in some upcoming podcasts, we'll be focusing specifically on some of those topics. But I think this this topic of what's broken now is a really good place to start because it helps us to also future pace what where's the opportunities in the future because wherever something's broken now I, I think and whether it is or isn't we'll talk we'll talk about in a minute <laughs> we'll talk about what that means but but I guess you know on the positive side for any brokers as well who might be listening in to this podcast I think wherever there's a perception anywhere about problems within an industry there's also an opportunity for early adopters to 
find a better way because, you know, if you're one of those early adopters who are jumping on a better way, then quite often you get the ability to establish a market before the rest of the industry catches up. So I think it's an opportunity, you know, let's not look at this as a negative. Let's look at this as, you know, potentially one viewpoint, whether or not everyone who's listening agrees, one viewpoint that is a good insight into what some people are thinking out there and therefore within it lies an opportunity for how we can envisage the future and how we can innovate. And I think this is true for all of us, not just, you know, we're talking about the broking industry here, but, you know, I'm very interested and I keenly listen to the sorts of things that we'll be covering today with a mind for, and what does this mean for how legal services look in the future? And, you know, if we've got accountants who are listening in, you know, I encourage you to think about it in that way as well. What does this mean for for all of us as advisors in this space. So then I think coming full circle, Simon, let, let's talk about this uh, edgy title, what's broken <laughs> in the broking industry. What What is broken? Why are we talking about this? What does this title mean? Yeah, well, look, yeah, as I say, I mean, I think uh, a lot of people have just had some negative experiences over the years. And, 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 and ultimately, look, you know, the common sort of complaints we tend to hear is that, you know, the brokers just didn't have enough experience or qualifications, which we sort of touched on. Um, you know, the brokers, I, I think there's this perception out there that brokers just don't do much, don't, don't do much work for their money. You know, I, I've heard this firsthand from, from clients. Oh, yeah, the broker, I don't even know what he did. And it's, it sort of says to me that there's a real lack of understanding about um, how difficult it can be to sell a business and what's really involved behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, it's, and, and the other one is that the common one is that, oh, brokers, you know, promise the world, they tell me they're going to get me a million dollars or five million or whatever the sort of valuation might have been. And, and then once we got into the process, all they did was push me to take lower prices or a lower, you know, valuation. And, you know, that was frustrating and we didn't like that. And, you know, look, I guess many of these complaints may well be founded, uh, well founded, but it's not all like that. I think like you sort of led, led to a moment ago, I think people genuinely, um, all people out there really want to do good work. They want to be proud of what they do. They want to deliver good results. They want happy clients and and everybody would like to be paid and paid reasonably well for the effort that they put in so it's you know it's not as i just don't think it's as dark and and sinister and, and simplistic as a lot of people sort of throw out there. Mm. But, you know, within, I guess, in these areas that you say you've you've heard complaints about, you know, perhaps lack of experience and qualifications or, you know, a lack of understanding of what what they're getting paid for, for the commission, I guess the the risk for brokers or advisors in the, in the space is that then you're, you're getting to the point where customers don't want to pay. And then, you know, that can create headaches in terms of, you know, recovery of payment or complaints that are being made. And, and, and you know, unhappy customers, clients take time and often cost money, you know. So it's in the interests of everyone within the industry to be on the front foot of tackling why these issues might be occurring, why these complaints are being raised um, in this particular way. And you're talking here about the model as well uh, of the broking industry as a whole. So what what is the model generally? I mean, you know, I, I think almost all listeners to this podcast will understand the concept of the broking industry that quite often works on a um, on a, on a commission you know, on the basis of sale. And of course, only being paid at the point of transaction, which I think is dangerous, you know, only being remunerated when they actually get the deal across the line. And of course, it makes sense from the perspective that that's when, you know, the the, the seller or the vendor is getting paid. So then they, they, they pay the broker or the M&A consultant or whoever it is that helps to facilitate the transaction. But it really you know, I think can create sometimes a difficult situation for brokers, you know, changes where they might put their focus on in a transaction because they just want the deal across the line sometimes <laughs> because they don't get paid if, the, if it doesn't yeah, get across yeah. the line. Well, this is the thing. And, and, and I think commission, I think you're absolutely right. Commission only models generally lead to poor outcomes. And I think that for, for business owners, for the vendors, 
they, um, you know, they're looking at it as a, well, it's, I guess it's a lower risk option and, uh, you know, I don't need to pay unless they get the job done. And, and they think that that motivates then the broker to go out there and they're going to push really hard for, for this and a push hard for a higher valuation because it's a percentage. And so they, they often business owners think that that is the best model for them. And I guess what we're here today saying is that that, that model actually doesn't in our view, deliver the best outcomes for business owners. It doesn't deliver the best outcomes for business brokers. And and invariably, it actually creates a, a, a pretty poor experience for buyers as well. You know, and look, and, you know, we can talk all about how it came about and whatever else. And I do think a lot of it's a hangover from the, the real estate industry. But ultimately, I think if you look at it, the, the commission only model really leads to to poor planning and preparation and you know i think i think brokers are out there when they're on a commission only model they they want to get lots of listings you know how do i get the listing i don't i don't get paid to a business gets sold and i've got to list it before i can sell it and so they're rushing out there and usually i think that process gets you know it, it's far too speedy they take a set of financials they ask some preliminary questions great you know and I've, I've even heard brokers saying look yeah we can get you listed by the end of this week you know and you know, to me, I'm thinking, whoa, slow down a bit here, you know, like this, this is one of the, the client's biggest assets. And it's undoubtedly the most complicated and complex and messy asset they own. They own. So, you know, that's not the kind of situation you want to rush. And certainly from a legal perspective, you know, I, I've seen time and time again that businesses that take um, a, a, take an exit process with a bit of foresight, so incorporate a bit of planning and time prior to exit, you know, get themselves cleaner, get themselves in a better spot for due diligence, where, you know, which is really, you know, opening the hood, <laughs> looking under the hood of a business and, you know, and also deliver themselves many times better tax outcomes. So, you know, there's, I, I, you know, I'm an advocate for pre-planning prior to exit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, the funny thing is, I say, it's, it puts the two parties in sort of different scenarios. On one hand, you know, you've got a broker who's very um, keen to get things going and get it moving. You know, we've got to get this process started because we only get paid at the end. And then the business owners who are often, you know, often they actually do want to get out and get out, you know, fairly quickly as well. But of course, they're in the middle of running their business. And so they'll actually say, yeah, yeah, great. Look, let's do this. Yes, get started by the end of the week. Brilliant. You know, so everybody's on the same page there. And then come Monday, um, oh, geez, I've got to take care of all those other things in my business. And oh, you know what? I haven't had time to get all that stuff that you're asking for. I'm ill prepared for this. And, you know, you'll hear from brokers all the time. My goodness, you know, this this vendor just went off the radar for months, wouldn't send, send me anything. We're trying to put the IM together. We're trying to do all this stuff for them. And so it's, they're sort of at a bit of a log ahead. And, and that can really harm a broker as well because, you, you know, even if your main motivation is to get to the finish line, and, you know, hell, look, let's let's be clear, our motivation is all to get our clients to the finish line. But if, you, you know, your only remuneration is at the finish line, then, you know, obviously from a business perspective, it's a little bit harder to, you know, justify spending time earlier on in the process. You know, there's so many issues that this can create along the way, I, I guess, is the reality here. Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think sometimes, you know, with some vendors, they need to even be asking the question whether their appropriate finish line is, is actually selling. Um, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, decisions can be made in an emotional state. And part of planning is, is really asking, you know, what is it that you really want? Because, you know, let's face it, I mean, none of us are, are, are born to, to do business. We're all born to live. And so your business should be a, a vehicle to help deliver the life that you want. And so, you know, I think asking those questions up front and that, and that really sort of gets to the heart of sort of exit planning and asking what's important in your life and where you want to go with things and, and does this vehicle help deliver that life and that goal for you? Mm, that's, you know, I, I think that's a really important point. I guess just circling back slightly, we, we got to that point because we were talking about some of the issues that brokers suffer getting to the finish line because they have clients that, you know, don't provide financials on time or don't provide information on time and, you know, that can lead to a deal to fall through. So I guess those issues, if um, brokers don't have their processes in place to ensure that they are not putting businesses to market until they actually have all of that information in, in a clear way, you, you know, they're creating issues for themselves, you know, Absolutely. particularly if they're not getting paid to the finish line. 
Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And and look, and I I, re- I think every broker out there who may be listening to this will relate to to this story of having a a vendor who you know might have also been pushing the process and just not then not giving them the information and just having those it basically just turns into a really messy process. And, you know, I sort of liken it to, um, you know, you, you've just arrived in Sydney and, and somebody's told you, you know, I, I live in this particular house number in this particular street out in the middle of uh, Fairfield. You, and so you jump in a car and you're about to drive out there and you have absolutely no idea where Fairfield is. You've got no map, no instructions, no directions. All you know is that you've got to kind of head west. And, you know, that's it's it's going to lead to problems. You're going to take a lot of wrong turns make a lot of errors along the way. And and let's face it, I mean, life is a wonderful teacher. <laughs> Experience is a wonderful teacher. But it's a really expensive lesson. And, uh, and it costs you a lot of time and it costs you a lot of money. And, you know, realistically, I mean, the idea of working with professionals is that you, you stand on the shoulders of somebody who's been there before. You get to, you know, look over the fence and over the hill and understand what the journey should be like in an ideal scenario. And you plan it properly. Let's take a short break. When we get back, Simon introduces us to an alternative remuneration model, which he believes delivers the best outcome for all parties. We'll talk about how it works and how to deal with the possible challenges you might face when suggesting this model to clients. And that's next. I'm Joanna Oki, and you are listening to The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast brought to you by the commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Welcome back. Earlier, we talked about Simon's background in the M&A space and drilled into why we're talking about this topic of what is broken in the broking industry. Just before the break, we also identified problems with the commission-only model and why it's leading to poor outcomes for business owners, brokers, and even buyers. Now, let's jump back to our conversation with Simon to talk about an alternative remuneration model, which delivers better outcomes for all stakeholders to a business deal, at least according to Simon. Let's hear his view on that. We've given some real depth to what's broken what can we do about it, Simon? What's your suggestion of what the alternatives are? Yeah, so look, I guess our approach has, has been that, um, you know, we talk to clients up front and, and certainly spend the time to understand a bit more about them and, and where they're going with their life. Um, you know, it's it, what are the obje- uh, objectives of what they're trying to achieve? But, you know, when it comes to the actual model of how we work, you know, we talk to our clients about uh, the fact that we charge a monthly retainer. And why do we do that? I mean, it's it's really about saying that we want to take the time to make sure that we're really prepared. We want to understand your business because if we have better preparation, we're going to have a better process and a better outcome. And so we actually take the time up front with our clients to, to run what we call an internal due diligence process. So in other words, we, we put on the lens of a buyer and we say, okay, uh, here are some of the tough questions that uh, that we would want to know if we were buying your business. Uh, and we go through everything from the financials, the operational side of things, all of your systems and processes. And look, let's be real. I mean, I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of companies that have, you know, into the very, you know, millions and millions of dollars of turnover. And, uh, and some of them don't have simple business processes. They don't have a business plan. They don't have uh, a financial forecast. They don't have a way of, 
explaining their marketing and sales processes, let alone having them written down. So, you know, there are a lot of things there that um, that do need to be addressed. And I think if you you sort of ask yourself the question, you know, what is it that we're actually selling and what is it that a buyer is buying? And, you know, in its most simple terms, I mean, buyers are, are ultimately buying your future stream of profits. In its most simple terms, that's what it is. But then they will apply a discount factor to that uh, to that valuation based on how much risk they see in your business. So, you know, if we look at a little more about what that looks like, I mean, you know, if a, if a business a buyer comes in and starts looking at your business and you can't articulate what your strategy is and how you obtain clients and what sort of reliability and credibility you have around that, you know, conversions and you know that they want consistency and reliability and. If you can't explain that sort of stuff and there are anomalies in your financials and basically it's, you know, you're the buyer, the broker and the vendor and, and everybody is doing sort of uh, discovery on the hop, um, then you're not going to have good answers. You're not going to have, you're not going to be able to present your business in the best possible light. And of course, in a buyer's mind, they're simply saying, well, goodness me, if there are this many problems when I'm asking simple questions, what am I going to find out after I've pulled back the curtain and I'm really, I'm in this business boots and all. Yeah. And and I don't think I don't think there's any brokers or advisors out there that I, I that I've spoken to who would have any different point of view in terms of the importance of this planning process. But uh, you know com- coming back to I guess the the issue that we're talking about here uh, I guess part of the issue is that where remuneration only sits at the finishing line you know, it, it can become really hard to um, feel that you're getting value a, as a broker or consultant from spending a lot of time in that preparation phase. So, and, and I think a lot of people who are in the industry would be interested to hear a bit more about um, how the retainer model works for you. And I, I certainly know that we know a number of consultants in the M&A space and, and the business sales and acquisition space who can really make retainers work well for, for them. Um, and, and sometimes these consultants will then adopt a different terminology, which will be exit advisors or exit strategists or those sorts of things, I, I guess. And indeed, is, is that the sort of name you work under, Simon? Like, do you see yourself as a broker or as, a, as an exit strategist? No, you, you, it's a great point, and, and look, we certainly see ourselves more as uh, as a strategist, uh, an advisor. Um, really, to us, the selling of a business is really one sort of step of a process, and it's not the only option. We really see our role, and and this is really where we spend most of our time these days. Is probably three quarters of it is in this sort of coaching, consulting, advisory role, and only about a quarter of our time is actually selling businesses because. You know, we find that a lot of business owners, once they start going through this discovery process and, and, and really understanding what's important to them, um, and then we spend time working on their business, building value. And, and I should say, you know, we, we work with clients from anything to sort of one to five years before they actually want to exit. And so there are three real components about what we do. One is how do we help you create a strategy and really build value in your company? How do we help you do exit planning and, and, and an efficient exit strategy? And then really the third component of which is business sales only occurs if, if, if selling is the exit option that they want. For some of our clients, we've found that they've come to us saying, look, we want to sell. And then after they've started going through this process, they've actually fallen in love with their business again because it starts operating properly and they're making more money out of it. And they're just really happy. And that entrepreneurial spirit comes through and they're saying, look, we're not sure we actually want to sell anymore. And and I guess therein, that's that's the difficulty, isn't it? For if if you're a broker and advisor in this space and you're being remunerated on sale, you know, gosh, that makes it really hard for you to be open to pushing alternatives for your client. It's, it's the old saying, right, Joanna? If, you, if all you've got is a hammer, you treat everything like a nail. And unfortunately, you know, I think a lot of brokers are pegged into this spot where you know the market has trained them, and and I guess in turn the the, the, the industry is also training the market that. This commission-only model is how it works and what you should be doing. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's obviously brokers are then incentivized to push to get a quick deal done, um, as we've spoken about, as opposed to saying, well, look, you know what? I'm remunerated to make sure that you are very clear on what you want and that we're delivering the best possible outcomes. And, you know, 
I, I'm sure all brokers who may be listening to this will, will relate to a client at some point who might have got six to nine months in a process and started changing their mind about where they wanted to sell for whatever reason, right? And so, you know, all of a sudden their motivations are, are, are diametrically opposed. And whereas if the broker is actually receiving a retainer, their interests are, are more focused on the client's need. And, and if that means that they want to stop selling, well, okay, that's the, the broker's certainly been paid for their time and, and nobody should be expected to work for free. But also if the, the vendor is getting offers and those offers aren't necessarily aligned with their valuation expectations or, you know, in some s- situations I've seen the buyer is not really aligned with the vendor's legacy and what they want to leave behind. And, and I've had vendors I say, there's no way I want to sell this guy. He's going to completely gut my company. He's going to destroy what I've spent 20 years building. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it to my staff. I couldn't do it to my to the brand of the business. So, you know, all of a sudden when you, your motivations are, are aligned appropriately, then the broker can go back with confidence and say, you know what, if this guy's not the right guy, then let's say no and let's move on and let's keep going with other people who are more aligned with our values and, and where we want to go with things. I'd like to just drill quickly into, because um, we're running out of, of time here, but this is some really interesting content that we're talking about here. I, I just want to drill just briefly into this retainer remuneration model a bit more because I, I feel like I can hear some sighs from our listeners out there. You know, um, we love the idea of retainers, but but it's hard work. You know, let's talk about the positives and the negatives and, and I'll throw out some negatives. I, 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 I can almost feel across, uh, you know, the airspace at the moment <laughs> in that, look, it sounds awesome. We'd love, we'd love to get paid along the way and then to be able to provide value on that basis but clients tell us that they they want to pay when they get their payday you know that surely that's one particular you know issue with the process and and, and i guess you know one other objection i i sort of feel out there might be, well, we like the idea from a client perspective on payment upon successful closing of the transaction because then you're only get pay, you only get paid when you've done your job in the way that you should have, i.e. I've gotten the outcome of selling my business and you get so you get remunerated at that point. So so I can feel that they're the, that they that they might be issues for brokers out there trying to or or advisors in the space trying to convince their clients that this is a a better remuneration model than it all being caught up at the point of the transaction completing. What what do you say to each of those? Yeah, look, well, I mean, I think firstly, I mean, I think we probably covered off on uh, on you know, what are the motivations sort of behind a a retainer model and why it's ultimately in everybody's best interest. So, you know, I think for for all brokers and advisors out there, you know, if you want to change, right, you've got to be willing to change yourself and change your approach. And so I would be saying to all brokers out there, you've got to be brave enough to sort of say, no, you know what, this is a better model and and here's why we believe in it and, and, and be able to have that discussion with your clients. And and how do you find that goes? You know, do do you f- feel sometimes there's pushback in the marketplace when you're talking about this alternate remuneration model? Definitely, there are some clients who push back on it. But you know what? It, it, just like, I guess, what you've got to ask yourself is: at the end of the day, we're in a business of of helping clients. We we coach, consult, we do broking. We're actually not a bank, <laughs> so so funding somebody else's business as well is is really not what we do. So. Look, we take a lot of confidence out of the fact that we know we can deliver value. We know that if we run this properly and we spend the time up front, that we will get the better outcome. Because look, let's face it, Joanna, like you're going to spend the time somewhere. You know, there is a cost to everything and the cost is usually time and money. Um, and that cost is going to be borne. But do you want to um, spend less time and less money through the whole process and make sure it runs a lot smoother? Uh, because by doing and following this model, they're the outcomes that we're finding. I think it really comes back to being able to talk through it and demonstrate that value to the uh, to the client. And if you don't feel, if you're out there and you're a broker at the moment and you don't have 
the confidence, I guess, around that pre-planning phase, then then go and talk to someone yourself, right? Spend some time, look at that because, you know, ultimately if we want to change how this industry is viewed and, and we want to all, and I imagine everyone listening to this feels this way, we all want to deliver better outcomes for our clients and all the various stakeholders, then we've got to look at a different way of doing things. Look, this has been a really great episode, Simon. I think I think it's really good to have these discussions and I think these this sort of topic should be discussed more. I mean, I know there is a lot of discussion out there in the marketplace But I just quite often feel that there's just this perspective of it's too hard, you know, clients just don't want it. It's too hard to convince them. So I think part of the element is it's almost a marketing and education component is being able to clearly articulate the value in a different approach in order that you within the industry can provide more value and are remunerated for providing more value along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the the bottom line is remembering that we're all people. Everyone's dealing with people, and I, I think we talk about the, the what's broken in the industry. A lot of it is just that there's too much simplistic generalisation, and, and and you know, oh, well, if something's wrong, it's their fault. Or you know, I think if we all take a step back a, a moment and we understand what are the real outcomes we're all trying to get, and and respect the fact that hey, we're all people, and everyone's trying to do a good job. Then if we come at it from that angle, then we can come up with a model that not only works for everybody, but as we said, delivers a a much better result. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Well, look, Simon, thank you so much um, for your time today. If any of our listeners want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Um, Look, by all means, feel free to go to our uh, our website at exitadvisory.co. That's .co, not .com. But um, or or by all means, if, if they get on there, if anyone would like to reach out, you know, our contact details are there. Um, look, I'm always happy to take a call or chat to people, whether you're in the industry or you're a buyer or you're looking to sell. You know, sometimes I think just having that outside person to um, to bounce some ideas off can be helpful. So yeah, great. And look, do you do you work with um, accountants and maybe even brokers in helping them prepare clients for sale? You know, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is something that <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that it isn't realistic in the industry. But you you know, if brokers come to you and they say, look, we we need some. You know, we've had a client come to us um, and we don't think they're ready yet. We don't do this. Pre- pre-prep service, pre-exit service, but can they send their clients to you so that you then send them back to um, the broker when it comes to point of sale? Definitely, definitely. Look, and I'm, I'm seeing more and more of this in the market and it, and it, and it cuts both ways. I, I've had um, I've had people who are in the sort of broking space saying, hey, do you think you could help this client get ready for sale? Uh, and then obviously hand them back to, to them for the actual sale transaction, which is absolutely fine. Um, I, I've had other consultants come to us say, listen, we love your message around, you know, focusing on um, building the value of the asset and really looking out for the clients. We do a lot of this stuff, but we don't do broking. And so could you handle that, that end point? And so, you know, we get to have a real discussion around what they've been doing, around how they're building value, how they've been positioning the company. And so, yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, as, as we've said, I mean, we all do different things and do them so, or even the similar things we do, we can do slightly differently. But I think if we've all got the focus on delivering really great value for our clients, then then we can certainly uh, work together in, in different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, Simon. I think it's been a really interesting look through uh, the remuneration model in the broking industry. A uh, bit of a controversial topic about whether it's broken or not, but certainly it raises some good issues that we should all be thinking about in terms of, you know, where's the value creation, how are we all aligning ourselves to really getting to that right outcome um, for all of the parties? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and well, thanks for having me, uh, having me on, Joanna. It's been great chatting to you. Fabulous. Thanks, Simon. And that concludes our interview with Simon Bedard of the Exit Advisory Group. As a quick recap, Simon and I talked about the problems with the commission-only remuneration model in the broking industry and why this leads to poorer outcomes for all parties to a transaction. Simon then suggested the retainer model as an alternative form of remuneration that brokers and business owners ought to consider. And we also drill into why this type of model can potentially lead to better outcomes. Then we close this episode out with the marketing and educational element that comes with this new approach. Now, if you liked what you heard today, please subscribe to The Deal Room Podcast on your favorite podcast player to be the first to know when a new episode is out. 
we release a brand new episode each week. Check out our show notes at www.thedealroompodcast.com for links to Simon and his team at the Exit Advisory Group. Now, thanks again for listening in. This has been Joanna Oki and The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 